Hi, everybody. Welcome to Brady Lane's Online Worship Time. I'm Leanna Atwell, and today I'm joined by Vicki Maris and Cheryl Fletcher. Today we're going to be doing some original music, uh, as well as traditional hymns. Uh, but this first song is uh, very special. It's a kid's song. So uh, invite your kids to come uh, and sing along with us.
than my dreams You know me from the inside out The more I get to know you and let you lead The less I doubt You are bigger than a pain I past our hate You are greater than our scars I doubt our shame You make us stronger than the lies You remind me You are bigger than our pain, our past, our hate You are greater than our scars, our doubt, our shame You make us stronger than the lies Braver than the fear, you meet us here when we call on you You meet us here when we call on you You meet us here when we call on you You meet us here when we call on you For so long, I cannot find the way to save myself. To let go of the things that hold me down, I need your help. Well, you are bigger than our pain, our past, our hate. You are greater than our scars, our doubt, our shame. You make us stronger than the lies, braver than the fear. You meet us here when we call on you. You meet us here. As we go into our next song, I encourage you to prepare your hearts for communion. We will sing this song, uh, then we'll play a brief instrumental, and at the end, Jeff will invite us to partake together.
prepared to do so, please gather your emblems to take communion with us at this time. Please take the emblems as you are directed to. I'll be reading from Matthew 26. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body. You may partake the bread. Then he took a cup, and when he gave thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. May God bless the taking of the Lord's Supper today. Good morning, everyone who is watching today, and especially those of you who maybe are joining us for the first time. We'd like to welcome you as part of the Brady Lane Church family this morning. We're glad that you have joined us. We hope that you will maybe come and join us sometime after this shelter-in-place situation is over, or this COVID-19 situation has come to an end. Uh, we have set a date of May 17th as our Come Back to Church Sunday. Um, of course... That's still up in the air. We're waiting to see if it could be shorter or it could be longer. We don't know. Uh, and I know it seems like a long time away, but we will continue to be vigilant in protecting all of you from this virus until this crisis is over. We are in the third week of the His Time sermon series. We have looked at the Lord's Supper a couple of weeks ago. Last week we studied the Garden Prayer. And this week we'll be covering the arrest and trials of Jesus as we progress through these final hours of Jesus' life. Throughout this series, we have been examining the fact that Jesus knew his time. He knew everything that was going to happen. He knew everything was going to go according to the plan set out by the Father. Jesus knew what was coming. He knew that the supper he instituted would be the last he would eat. He knew that Judas was out betraying him as he was handing out the emblems. He knew that they were going to head out to the Garden of Gethsemane for the last time to prepare for what was going to happen the next day. He knew all the disciples would either deny or completely abandon him. He knew that he would be arrested, unlawfully prosecuted, and put to death. He knew everything. How would you live your life differently today if you knew tomorrow you would die? 
something for you to think about as we watch our next video in this series. Today we again are going to listen to the reading of a harmonization of the gospel from Matthew 26, Luke 22, and John 18. An excerpt from the story written by Randy Frazee. Take a look. Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him, went out and asked them, Who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. I am he, Jesus said. And Judas the traitor was standing there with him. When Jesus said, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Again he asked them, Who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they said. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. If you are looking for me, then let these men go. This happened so that the words he had spoken would be fulfilled. I have not lost one of those you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Jesus commanded Peter, put your sword away. Shall I not drink the cup? the Father has given me? And he touched the man's ear and healed it. Then Jesus said to the chief priests, the officers of the temple guard, and the elders who had come for him, Am I leading a rebellion that you have come with swords and clubs? Every day I was with you in the temple courts, and you did not lay a hand on me. But this is your hour, when darkness reigns. Soldiers of the Jewish religious establishment had come to place Jesus under arrest, and Jesus gave himself up. He could topple his foes with a word. He had the power to call on vast armies of angels to rescue him, but instead he surrendered. The disciples knew something very bad was happening, and they ran away to save their own skins. Jesus was left alone with his captors. Those who had arrested Jesus took him to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the teachers of the law and the elders had assembled. But Peter followed him at a distance, right up to the courtyard of the high priest. He entered and sat down with the guards to see the outcome. The chief priest and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for false evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death. But they did not find any though many false witnesses came forward. Finally, two came forward and declared, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. Then the high priest stood up and said to Jesus, Are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent. The high priest said to him, I charge you under oath by the living God, Tell us if you are the Messiah, the, the Son of God. You have said so, Jesus replied. But I say to all of you, from now on, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, He has spoken blasphemy. Why do we need any more witnesses? Look now, you have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? He is worthy of death, they answered. Then they spit on his face and struck him with their fists. Others slapped him and said, Prophecy to us, Messiah, who hit you? I hope you have enjoyed these videos with the harmonized gospel. I know it isn't how we would normally take in scripture, but I, I think it helps me at least to visualize the entire scene that is happening and include all the points of view of the gospels into one. Now in the first part of today's text, we see that Jesus knew everything that would happen. And we find this in John's gospel, chapter 18, starting in verse 4 with the line that Jesus knew everything. He knew that this night was going to be brutal, and he knew tomorrow was going to be worse. He knew, folks, everything that was about to happen to him. He knew that Judas would hand him over. He knew that Peter would attack Malchus. He knew that the disciples would run away. He knew that he would be drug off to a trial based on false charges. 
He knew the Pharisees would do whatever they had to do to put him down for good. He knew that there would be an all-night back and forth from the Jews to Pilate to Herod to the Jews back to Pilate, a mock trial that would see him battered and cursed and humiliated. He knew there would be a scourging, and he knew that there would be a crown of thorns. He knew that he would experience the undeserved humiliation beyond what any man had ever faced. He knew that he would face and experience a suffocating death after being hung by his hands and feet from a cross. He knew there would be a spear thrust into his side. He knew everything. And yet his response to the Jews when they came out to arrest him was, Who is it that you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they said. I am he, he responded. And the text says that they drew back and fell to the ground. Jesus said, I am he. The unspeakable name of the Almighty God. When they heard that, they drew back and fell. Think of that for a moment. Picture that scene in your mind. In that time, these men lay flat on their backs or on their face in the dirt, distracted by the power of the name, the holy name of God. Jesus could have fled. He could have ran in that moment. He could have gotten away. He had done so in the past when the heat was on. He was able to escape through the crowds. But instead, he waited for them all to get up, regain their composure, and he asked them again, Who is it that you want? And again, they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And this time, Jesus said, I told you I am he. If you want me, then let these other people go. Jesus gives himself up. He surrenders. Now, folks, Jesus does this for a few reasons. We see this played out also in Luke 22 and Matthew 26. First, he knew his time. As we have said throughout this series, Jesus knew it was the time to go. It was time to launch this final act of salvation of all humanity. It was time to fulfill the will and the plan of God. But Jesus also knew the time of darkness. The Luke 22 passage says that Jesus knew this was also the time of darkness. This is a reference to the fact that this was the moment that God was going to allow Satan to win the battle so that God could win the war. This was the moment that darkness was going to reign like it never had before. A trial held in darkness. A betrayal in darkness. A denial in darkness. He was deserted in the darkness and he would die. In the darkness. When Jesus confronted those who had come to seize him, he says to them, you, you came after me with weapons? Like I'm so violent? Like I'm some type of rebellion leader? And he said this because he knew that this is how the Jewish leaders looked at him. And then he says, this is your hour when darkness reigns. Jesus is talking both to the Jewish leaders, and I believe he is also talking to evil itself. There's a temporal message that is happening here, along with a spiritual message. I think he's calling out the Jewish leaders, but he's also calling out Satan. Now next, Jesus gave himself up because it was part of the plan. All four Gospels talk about Jesus surrendering to the Jewish leaders without a fight. There was no struggle the surrender was on purpose. It was part of the plan God had set into motion. Now before we move on to the trials themselves, I wanted to briefly look at the disciples' response. Now the first disciple we're going to look at is Judas. Judas betrayed, then committed suicide. We know from Scripture that Judas, after betraying Jesus, sees the error in his ways. He becomes remorseful and he goes back to the Pharisees. He tries to wash his hands of the situation by giving them back the 30 pieces of silver that they had paid him to betray Jesus. And they tell him, we don't care about the money. We don't need that back. We got what we wanted. And so Judas is racked with guilt. He goes off and he hangs himself. Many speculate that Judas' suicide kept him from repentance, which would then for, therefore land him in hell. Be careful with that assumption. Scripture does not say anything about Judas after this moment. Probably a consequence of his actions. But remember what Jesus says, I have not lost one of those that you gave me. 
And when he asked the Jewish guards to let the disciples go, that included Judas. Judas was still standing there. He was still considered a follower of Jesus by the Jews. He was a man basically without a country, as the saying goes. The Jews didn't want him. The disciples wouldn't want him around after this great betrayal. In his great remorse and in his great guilt, he found he had no other choice. And I truly believe, and you can call me nuts if you want to, you can say I'm crazy, but I truly believe that if Judas had still been around, sitting at that campfire with Peter and the other disciples after Jesus resurrected, that Jesus would have come up and restored Judas just as he did Peter. You know, no one sin is greater than any other sin. And all sins can be forgiven. Did Judas repent? I don't know. And you don't know either. We weren't there. Let's be careful not to damn Judas to hell because we might be surprised someday when we get to heaven, if we're so blessed, to find him there. His fate is not our decision or our call. Really, it's up to God. Again, I'm not preaching that Judas is in one place or the other. I'm saying his eternal locale is in the hands of the Almighty God. So we shouldn't assume his fate by our judgment. Now, Judas wasn't the only disciple that acted in inappropriate ways. Peter attacked and then denied three times. Peter draws a sword and attacks one of the servants of the high priest, probably a temple guard, that grabs Jesus to take him under arrest. This servant's name, we find out from one of the gospel accounts, is Malchus. Jesus scolds Peter for something I think we need to hear loud and clear and maybe apply to ourselves today. He says, Peter, stop trying to assert your will over God's. In the text, he says, put your sword away. I have to do what I have to do to fulfill God's will. Now, how often, Christians, do we assert our will over God's will? How often do we think we know what's better for us than trusting that God knows what's best for us? How often do we carry things out the way we want to because that's the way we've always done it? Or that's how it's always happened in the past? I think while this warning was directed at Peter alone in this moment, I think we can still learn something from it. I think we need to take heed in our walk today that when God's will is set into motion, we need to stay out of the way of it. God's will be done. Peter also famously denies Jesus three times that night to fulfill prophecy Jesus gave while they were eating supper together. Now, the rest of the guys... The rest of the disciples, we've talked about Judas, we've talked about Peter. What happened to the rest of them? What did the rest of them do? The others ran. They just simply ran away. Just as Jesus predicted, the good shepherd was struck and the sheep scattered. Was it fear? Probably. Lack of faith? Maybe. Lack of spiritual maturity? Sure. Shock and awe? Most definitely. Remember, just a few minutes ago, these guys were all asleep. And I think if they had come back together immediately and all, all of them had gone with Peter and John to follow behind and see what happened to Jesus, to see how everything played out, I would blame their running away on shock and awe. But folks, these guys stayed away. They quit. They went and hid, some of them for days, some of them for weeks. Have you ever found yourself in a moment of weakness, becoming frightened, finding yourself in a moment of spiritual drought, struggling because you have still not matured in your faith as much as you'd like to, and in all that you find that you are running away from Jesus? And I have. In my early 20s, there was a season when I went through several difficult, life-changing, life-altering situations. I lost two of my grandparents within three months of each other, both on my mom's side. Lost a couple of friends in separate auto accidents. Was struggling with school and questioning my direction for my whole life. I was going through the ending of a long-term relationship. And I began to question. I began to fear. I began to regress in my maturity. And I began to run away. From Jesus. And to be honest, I got a lot further away from God than a lot of people knew. 
I'm not proud of that time of my life. I'm not proud of the way I abandoned my faith. But I look at the disciples here and I realize I was just like them. When trouble came, instead of running to Jesus, I ran away from him. Thank God, I thank God every day that he got a hold of me. And I began running back in his direction. And I'm continuing to run to him every day. Every day I take another step in his direction. And I still make mistakes. I still struggle from time to time. But every day I dress myself off, off and I pick myself up and I start running after him again. Where are you right now? Do you find yourself running away? Or are you running toward Jesus? Something else for you to wrestle with this week. Now on to the situation that gives us our title for today's message, the unlawful prosecution of Jesus. This part of the story is the part that always brings out my righteous anger. It's the part that stirs my passion. It gets me fired up. Maybe it does you too. This set of trials that Jesus goes through from the time he is arrested until the time that he is sentenced to death on the cross was a complete and utter abandonment of true law. First, the trial was held at an illegal time. According to Jewish law, it was illegal to hold any type of hearing, any type of process, any type of trial at night. It was illegal. You weren't supposed to do it. And it was certainly not supposed to happen in a secret place. And we see this discussed in Mark 14, 53 through 65, and also in Mark 15, 1. Second, there was allowed illegal witnesses. False witnesses were sought and brought in during the hearings and during the trial before the Sanhedrin. There was usually an elaborate screening process that witnesses had to go through before they were allowed to come in and publicly give their testimony before the Sanhedrin. But in this case, those screening processes were waived. And whoever wanted to come in could come in and say whatever they wanted to, as long as it helped the cause. Sound familiar? Third, Jesus was brought up on illegal charges. Jesus was charged, tried, and convicted without any defense provided. It was not sought by Jesus, but it was also not suggested or allowed for him. And these type of charges with such a serious nature behind them would not be allowed to have been brought forth in any other place than the Sanhedrin's meeting chambers at the temple. And in this case, it was held at the high priest's palace. These charges were also brought with a guilty until proven innocent mindset, which was not the proper way by Jewish law to bring someone to trial. Everything about the charges that were brought were illegal. Finally, the Jews wanted to carry out an illegal sentence. The death sentence that Jesus received for a charge of blasphemy was probably the legal charge that could be brought, the legal sentence that could be brought. Except that they had determined the death penalty for Jesus before the trial even started. John 11.50 and Mark 14.1 both tell us that the penalty of death had to be determined long before any trial happened. This makes the death sentence that eventually was called for illegal. Besides the fact that he was innocent of that charge in the first place, as he was, in fact, God's son. And here is the amazing part. This entire process that was filled with injustice and greed and hatred and envy, violence, Jesus responded in an incredible and unthinkable way. How did Jesus respond to the injustice, the hatred, the envy, the greed, the violence? With humble silence because it was part of the plan. Now some would take this text out of the totality of scripture context to mean that in the face of injustice, Christians should just remain silent. That we should step into, uh, we shouldn't step into the injustice of the world and act. We need to understand that this was an isolated incident that took place because Jesus had to surrender and submit to be able to carry out God's plan. So how do we know this again? Well, again, it's the totality of scripture. How did Jesus respond in other situations to injustice? Well, he responded with lament. When he entered into Jerusalem that final week, he looked over at Jerusalem and he wept because he saw all the injustice that was happening all around. 
He would look on people on many occasions and have compassion on them, even though they were just coming to him to get something from him. He looked at that injustice and he still had compassion and love for the people. But he was sorrowful when he did so. He responded with anger at times. A couple of occasions, he cleared the temple of the money changers and all the people who were selling sacrifices, animals to be sacrificed. Jesus responded with righteous anger by flipping over tables and driving out money changers with whips, trying to get them out of his father's house. But he also had several occasions where he had a righteous response to injustice. Like when he saw injustice happening to people like Zacchaeus, who was being pushed away and lost in the crowd so badly that he climbed a tree so he could see Jesus. And Jesus saw that injustice happening and saw how badly Zacchaeus wanted to just see him. And so he went to Zacchaeus and invited him to dine with him that night at his home. Or maybe we think of the tax collector friends of Matthew who were being picked on by the Jewish leaders and Jesus was scoffed at for spending time with them. And Jesus still spent the time. Or maybe the adulterous woman who Jesus ran off the accusers of. Or maybe the woman at the well. Every time he encountered someone that was going through a situation of injustice, he always inserted himself into the situation to bring grace, forgiveness, and justice where there was injustice. Now this brings us to an application main point for us today. As Christians, we are allowed to respond to injustice with sorrow, anger, and just actions. Sometimes we just need to remain silent. But no matter what the situation, no matter what kind of injustice we are encountering, no matter what kind of response we are thinking about giving to that injustice, we must take that injustice to God before we respond in any way. We need to talk to God about it. We need to see what His will for our response is going to be. Christians, we encounter a great deal of injustice in this world. And there are certainly times when injustice should make us sorrowful and sad. There are also situations of injustice in this world that should cause us to become righteously angry. All of these situations should bring us to a point of taking some type of action to bring justice to the situation. I also believe that there are moments when we should just pause and silently submit because that's God's will for us. And sometimes it's better to keep the peace and remain silent rather to avenge injustice. The time for this is when we have the opportunity in silence to point people to the grace of God. Regardless of our response, before we take any action, we need to take the injustice before God and ask for His will to be revealed to us. We are not to act like reckless vigilantes running all over the world solving everyone's issues. Again, we need to find the balance to our response. And that directive on how we should respond needs to come from the will of an all-seeing, all-knowing God. So God, go to God and seek His will before you take any action towards injustice. We need to rely on God and His will, not our own. If you would, please join me in a word of prayer. Father God, we come before you today, and as we think about this message as we think about how Jesus responded in this night of all nights as he responded to unjust trials as he responded to unjust treatment as he responded to unjust charges and an unjust death sentence as he was battered as he was bruised Father let us Rejoice in his willingness to choose to submit. And while I get fired up when I think about this part of the story, I, I get angry. I get righteously angry and I want to do something about it. Father, I know his silence was for a purpose. His silence was to bring about salvation. So, Father, today as we pause on this Sunday, March 29th, and we think about 
what's going to happen in the next couple of weeks as we approach the Easter season. Father, help us to look upon the injustice around us. And Father, we ask that you help, help us to understand your will and how you want us to respond. For Father, there are sometimes we see things that make us sad and, and hurt. We see things sometimes that make us righteously angry. So Father, help us deal with those emotions in a good way, in a healthy way. Let us insert ourselves into the world when you direct us to, to bring justice to those who are being exposed to injustice. And Father, help us to also understand and know when it's our purpose and your will for us to just remain silent and wait for you to work. It's been a hard thing for us to do right now, Father, is to wait on you. So just help us to do that over these next several weeks. Father God, if there's anyone watching this morning that has questions about who you are, please help them. Please prompt them. Please nudge them with the power of your Holy Spirit to contact somebody from Brady Lane Church that we might be able to sit down with them and talk to them over the phone or through a text message conversation or through Facebook Messenger or somehow that we get in touch with each other and, and talk about their salvation. Father, we thank you for all you do for us. We ask that you continue to guide us and direct us in this difficult time. Father, we pray for all of our frontline people who are out there making a difference in this situation, this epidemic that we are going through, this pandemic. Father, we pray for doctors and nurses. We pray for our first responders, police, fire, EMS. We pray for all those folks who are deemed essential and who are going out to their workplaces and, and continuing to serve our community. Father, we lift all of them up to you today. We lift these things up to you today. And Father, our last prayer for today is that you make this time that we are away from each other very short. Uh, that you bring us back together when it is safe. Uh, Father, we pray that the things that we have planned for this summer, the things that we have planned for this fall, will not be interrupted as the things for this spring have been. Not for our glory. None of these things we had planned were for our glory, Father. They were planned to bring you glory. So we pray that you help us. You eradicate this disease in our country and around the world. That you expedite vaccines and things that can help people get better. But until then, Father, help us to continue to protect those around us who could be at danger. And if we are one of those folks who could be at danger to be out, Father, I pray that you help them to understand that it's important for them to stay right where they're at. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. That is the end of our service for today. We hope that you have been blessed by not only the music that was brought this morning, but also the word of God that was brought before you, something for you to think about, reflect on. Tomorrow around 1 o'clock p.m., uh, both on our One Call system and through Facebook, uh, we will be releasing some questions and some Bible study. Uh, for you to do that as a follow-up to today's message. Some things for you to think about and, and ponder and to study. So I encourage you to look for those things around 1 o'clock on Monday. Um, Stacy's also released some kids' stuff for families to do this week. So I encourage you to get online and do those things together. Um, we, we hope that you're finding enough stuff to keep you in God's Word. I've been releasing a new scripture every morning on my personal Facebook page, and those scriptures are coming from my own Bible study every morning. Um, we're going to be continuing to give you the Thursday uh, afternoon, Thursday evening video messages from myself. Um, we're going to continue to put stuff out as often as we can uh, as far as announcements and updates on things. I do want to share with you folks that uh, earlier this week on Tuesday we had uh, our food pantry, uh, we did a drive-through food pantry rather than uh, having people come into the building. 
And I just want to thank all those who came out, our regular food pantry folks, as well as folks who had not worked in the food pantry before, uh, came out and helped uh, to try to protect some of our folks in the food pantry team who are in that danger zone of being exposed to COVID. So uh, we had a great turnout. We had 147 families that we served. Uh, we will have another one on April 14th. I know that seems like a long time away, uh, but there were five Tuesdays in the month of March. So that's why there's an extra week in between food pantries this time, which is unfortunate, but uh, maybe it's a good thing. It gives us some time to recover and get things set up again and ready. But anyway, continue to pray for each other. I encourage you to check on one another, just as I did Thursday uh, in my video on Thursday. Please, if you think of your friends from church that you normally sit around or people that you go to class with or life group with, uh, make sure we're checking on each other and taking care of one another. I've got, I got a few uh, cards and text messages uh, this week from some of you checking on Amy and I, which was awesome. And we thank you for that. Uh, such a blessing. So uh, until we see each other again, may God bless you and keep you. May cause his light to shine upon you and grant you peace.